With his top American field commanders, Generals Bradley, Patton, and Hodges, General Eisenhower plotted carefully the exact course of the Allied armies in the final phase of the battle for Europe. It was desirable to thrust our spearheads rapidly across Germany to a junction with the Red Forces, thus to divide the country and effectually prevent any possibility of German forces acting as a unit. In Berlin, Nazi party leaders like Propaganda Minister Joseph Goebbels were reminded more and more forcibly that the Allies were drawing closer. Allied planes now paid daily visits to the German capital. Resistance to the Allies was becoming much more difficult for the Nazis in all phases of their war effort. With fuel supplies at a new low, German trucks in Berlin were often taken in tow by trolley cars. On every level, the operation of the life of the city was crippled more seriously as the fronts on both the east and the west were pushed closer to Berlin. The Nazis were trapped in their doomed capital, but still refused to submit to the inevitable. The Allies sent out urgent appeals for the German people to surrender via broadcasts in their own language from Allied controlled stations, such as Radio Luxembourg. These broadcasts reached many thousands of German citizens. The German people were also advised that they would not be tortured and executed an idea that had been drummed into them by the Nazi propaganda machine. Dies bringt die Gesamtzahl der deutschen Soldaten, die sich in alliierten Kriegsgefangenen lagern, in Sicherheit befinden, auf nein I surrender. These broadcasts were effective. As the American soldiers took over control of Nazi towns and cities, many Germans, no longer dominated by the Wehrmacht, were quick to put themselves in allied hands. Many were still fearful that the Nazi claims about their torture by allied soldiers might be true but were soon convinced to the contrary. It now appeared that a double envelopment would not only finally and completely sever the industrial Ruhr from the remainder of Germany, but would result in the destruction of one of the major forces still remaining to the enemy. The industrial importance of the Ruhr to Germany had been greatly diminished even before we surrounded it. As a consequence of the threats now developing on both sides of that area, it would have seemed logical for the Germans to withdraw their military forces for use in opposing our forward advances. Certainly, it should have been clear that with the Ruhr surrounded, there would be lost whatever military forces might be jammed into its defenses. on the south and Montgomery's in the north fought steadily toward their appointed meeting place near Castle. The resistance to Simpson's 9th Army, which was on the right of Montgomery's army group, was more stubborn than that encountered by the 1st and 3rd Armies advancing out of the Frankfurt area. As a result, the southern arm of our pincers swung well around the eastern and northeastern flanks of the Ruhr to meet Simpson's advancing columns in the vicinity of Lippstadt, near Paderborn. By April 1st, just one week after the 21st Army Group had crossed the Rhine in the Basel sector, the junction was complete. The Ruhr was surrounded and its garrison was trapped. The Germans had now suffered an unbroken series of major defeats. On April 18th, the whole German garrison in the Ruhr surrendered. Originally, we had estimated we would capture about 150,000 of the German army in the Ruhr. In the final count, the total reached 325,000, including 30 general officers. We destroyed 21 divisions. Hitler must have hoped that the siege of the Ruhr would be as stubbornly contested as was that of Brest. But within 18 days of the moment the Ruhr was surrounded, it had surrendered with an even greater number of prisoners than we had bagged in the final Tunisian collapse almost two years earlier. During the final phase of the battle for Europe, the Nazi soldiers looked less and less formidable. The Wehrmacht, once composed of the pick of German young manhood, now included in its ranks 
youth who were really still children. Policing the Nazi prisoners had become a more demanding job. Sometimes former inmates of Nazi concentration camps were put in charge of guarding captured Nazi soldiers. The vital industries of the Ruhr, now completely lost to the Nazis, further crippled the badly weakened German war effort. The foundation on which Hitler's plan for world conquest had been built lay hopelessly smashed. With the Allies pushing steadily eastward, General Eisenhower paid a visit to General Patton at Gotha on April 12th, a notable date for the Supreme Commander. Before the day ended, the scenes I saw etched the date in my memory. General Patton's army had overrun and discovered Nazi treasure hidden away in a deep salt mine. In one tunnel, they found a hoard of gold estimated to be worth about $250 million, most of it in gold bars. There was also a great amount of minted gold from different countries in Europe, and even from the US. The same day, I saw my first horror camp. It was near the town of Gotha. I have never felt able to describe my emotional reactions when I first came face to face with indisputable evidence of Nazi brutality and ruthless disregard of every shred of decency. Up to that time, I had known about it only generally or through secondary sources. I am certain, however, that I have never at any other time experienced an equal sense of shock. I visited every nook and cranny of the camp because I felt it my duty to be in position from then on to testify at first hand about these things in case there ever grew up at home the belief or assumption that the stories of Nazi brutality were just propaganda. I felt that the evidence should be immediately placed before the American and British publics in a fashion that would leave no room for cynical doubt. With enemy forces in the Ruhr eliminated, the Allied attack to the eastward picked up momentum on all parts of the front. The route, which every Allied soldier kept constantly in mind, lay toward the Baltic Sea and Berlin. The principal attack was a major thrust at the center of the German line by the 12th Army Group under General Bradley's command. Bradley's advance was conducted on a broad front. On the south, the Third Army struck in the direction of the Czechoslovakian border. On Patton's left, the First Army attack, begun on April 11th, made rapid progress. On April 14th, the Third Armored Division of Collins' Seventh Corps reached Dassau, practically on the Elbe. This corps, which had been in the original assault against the Normandy beaches, and soon thereafter had captured Cherbourg, had fought all the way across northwest Europe from the coast of France to the river Elba. The stage was now set for the final allied moves of the campaign. The enemy had no means of restoring a single front against either the Russians or ourselves. Throughout western Germany, as the allied front moved swiftly eastward, some units were charged with checking on areas which the frontline troops had passed through hurriedly. The GIs rounded up a number of spies, and in addition, German soldiers who had quickly changed into civilian clothes. Whenever any Nazis in either classification were caught, the penalty was quickly executed by Allied military units. Six, ten, As more and more territory was captured by the Allies, thousands of American soldiers held captive by the Germans were recovered. Many of them had been taken prisoner as early as December 1942 in the early battles in Tunisia. And some of the British soldiers had been captured as far back as Dunkirk, nearly five years before. In many instances, the physical condition of the prisoners was so poor that great care had to be exercised in their feeding. The weaker ones were hospitalized, and for a period, our hospitals were crowded with men whose joy at returning to their own people was almost pathetic. 
but who at the same time were suffering so badly from malnutrition that only expert care could save them. My name is Charles J. Short. I'm from Akron, Ohio. I was captured in the Battle of the Bulge, December 19, 1944. After making us walk for about 40 miles, I believe our worst experience was being packed on a small boxcar, 60 men to one car. During this time, we had received absolutely nothing to eat. After we had gotten on the boxcar, we received about this amount of bread, a one day's ration. Occasionally, we got a bucket of water to drink. With Elias and the Russians drawing within range of each other, both forces had to use extreme caution to keep from finding themselves suddenly firing into or overrunning the other's lines. Russian liaison officers served with the Western Allied force and kept Soviet commanders informed of the advance of the British and American frontline troops. On April 25th, patrols of the 69th Division of the 5th Corps met elements of the Red Army's 58th Guards Division on the Elba. Meeting took place at Torgau, 75 miles south of Berlin. The 5th Corps, like the 7th, had participated in the initial assault on the beaches of Normandy, and it seemed fitting that the troops of one of these corps should be the first to make contact with the Red Army and accomplish the final severance of the German nation. In late April 1945, the savage battle for Berlin, so long feared by the German people, was begun. under Marshal Zhukov had penetrated deep into the Nazi capital. The battle raged on for some 12 days of intensely heavy fighting. The Russians had to rout the Nazis out of every cranny in the city, and in some cases, from hideouts below the ground. Last of the defenders surrendered to the Russians on May 3rd. Soviet commanders estimated that the futile defense of Berlin had cost the Germans half a million killed and captured. The climax of a war which had cost both sides hundreds of thousands of dead and wounded was finally over. After four exhausting years in which they had beaten the Nazis off in their drive toward Moscow, the Russians had won Berlin. The Nazi swastika, symbol of Hitler's new order, no longer flew over the city. Berlin was no longer a seat of German government, no longer capital of a German nation. For the first time in a century, a foreign power was in possession of the capital of the once mighty German nation. The Russians who first occupied Berlin were elated at the damage resulting from the saturation bombings by the British and American air forces in the months preceding the fall of the city. The Nazi empire, which Hitler had predicted would last for a thousand years, had been crushed to death only 12 years after its beginning. The devoted Nazi party followers had run the gamut from fanatical mass hysteria following their early victories to humiliating total defeat. The conquerors of Berlin took a special delight in unfurling their flag from Nazi symbols of military glory, like the Brandenburg Gate and the sacred precincts of the Reich's chancellery were now invaded by the calm but exultant Russian leaders. Reminders of the once worshipped Führer no longer had a place of eminence. In late April, the first official surrender by a Nazi area command took place at Caserta, Italy. The envoys of the top Nazi generals in the Italian theater surrendered unconditionally to the Allies on April 29th. The German surrender of Nazi-held territory in Italy and Austria was to become effective at noon on the 2nd of May. In the north, at Luneburg Heath, on May 4th, the Germans surrendered to the Allies, represented by Field Marshal Sir Bernard Montgomery, all their forces in northwestern Europe, except for the Nazi garrison in Norway. The German command to carry out at once 
and without argument or comment, all further orders that will be issued by the Allied powers on any subject. Disobedience of orders or failure to comply with them will be regarded as a breach of these surrender terms and will be dealt with by the Allied powers in accordance with the accepted laws and usages of war. The decision of the Allied powers will be final if any doubt or dispute arises as to the meaning or interpretation of the surrender term. That is the text of the instrument of surrender and the German delegation will now sign this uh, this paper, and uh, 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 they will sign in order of seniority, and uh, the General Admiral von Friedeberg uh, will sign first. Next. Now I will sign the instrument on behalf of the Supreme Allied Commander, the General Eisenhower. Now that concludes the formal surrender, and there are various matters now or details to be discussed, which we will do uh, in closed session. Complete Nazi capitulation came on May 7th at Reims, when the Allies, represented by General Eisenhower's Chief of Staff, General Walter Bedell Smith, accepted the surrender of Colonel General Alfred Jodl on behalf of the Nazi High Command. All hostilities were to cease at midnight on May 8th. The surrender instrument was signed by Yodel at 2.41 in the morning of May 7th, 1945.